This is the moment we have been waiting for. After long last, we have the Dynasty Deep Dive, and I feel like I can finally say college football is back. Literally the last Dynasty mode we have to reference is from NCAA 14, so that's exactly what we're gonna be doing as we go through College Football 25's Deep Dive. We're gonna compare and contrast NCAA 14 from the new game. The dynasty experience is gonna be anchored around three core pillars, building your coach, building your program, and delivering the world of college football. When we dive into one of the core pillars, building your coach, we can see one of the major differences is that no coach was great at everything and there is no single path to being a great coach. That is hard to say in NCAA 14, where I feel like almost everyone went to the recruiting skill tree, pumped that thing up, and then focus their points on the game day atmosphere. Two really important notes, it's a rock, paper, and scissors relationship between coach type and there's no dominant progression path. That means you're gonna have to make trade-offs throughout the entirety of your dynasty. What you're gonna have to keep in mind, like they said with the rock, paper, scissors relationship, if you go with Scheme Guru, you're more than likely gonna give up on the recruiting front or just another aspect of the coaching game. Heck, maybe you're giving up on the master referee manipulator tree and you won't be able to get as many friendly calls or phantom calls. I'm just messing with y'all, but what you can really take away is that there'll be no dominant progression path, meaning there'll be a ton of replayability because a coach can do it many different ways with many different skill trees to pursue. This feature is huge because now you have so much more flexibility and options to coach the game how you wanna coach it. You couldn't say that about NCAA 14 and you also couldn't say that coordinators and how you build your staff matter. To me in NCAA 14, it was pretty rinse and repeat with a singular path to go down. Now coach progression and coach XP goals, this is interesting. Here on the College Football 25 picture, we see four tabs for XP goals. Now in NCAA 14, there were eight tabs between awards, big games, game stats, pro draft, records, recruiting, season tats, and team. Now, I think there's potential some of these NCAA 14 categories were consolidated into four buckets, and that's what we see here in College Football 25. Regardless, I don't think there'll be any lack of depth for the amount of goals and XP that your coach gets for completing in-season challenges. Again, with the crispy menu screen, it is neat to see the weekly advanced summary and XP breakdown after a game. Coach archetypes, something that is completely new to College Football 25, didn't have this in NCAA 14, but there are a 11, 11 different archetypes with each their own focus and perks. You can go all in in a single category like recruiting where you can become an elite recruiter or you can become a hybrid coach strong in multiple areas. Regardless, the goal is to become a program builder or CEO atop the college football world. And even better, that means there is no single way to reach these statuses. To upgrade your archetype and for example, to become an elite recruiter, you have to spend 50 coach points and sign two top five recruiting classes before you can claim that title. Interesting note about the visual, like we touched on, you can't be great at everything, so half of the archetypes are locked. It gets deeper, trust me, within each each archetype, they're introducing more than 50 coach abilities. Each ability can have up to four tiers and they each have their own purchase costs associated with it. This whole set of abilities, for example, was specific to upgrading the fast tempo offense, which heck, I'm gonna be all over a fast tempo offense. So now you're starting to see the layers to it. You got the archetype at the top, then you got multiple abilities under the archetype. And then within each ability, there are four tiers to upgrade. Super, super important to be strategic with your coordinators because look at this line all of the coaches you bring in in the staff their abilities stack together meaning in essence it multiplies if you have similar style abilities some people might think of this as a con but i actually think it helps you be strategic from the get-go it says you won't be able to control what abilities your coordinator chooses or respect their abilities. So it makes it extremely important when you're making a decision of who you wanna bring in, in the scheme and style they play. I haven't really been able to compare anything to NCAA 14 in a minute because all of this coordinator control head coach skill ability archetype in depth stuff was not an NCAA 14. However, you did have a choice of whether you wanted to be head coach, offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator. So it's just good to know that you can still choose the coordinator path and work your way up towards a head coach somewhere in the nation. When you sign as a head coach in NCAA 14, you're met with a screen with the previous year's records and a target goal for number of wins in your upcoming season. In college football 25, you sign a contract as 
well, and it's all based on team prestige and program standing. There are four types of contract expectations, winning games, winning championships, making the playoffs, and winning national championships. In NCAA 14, you wouldn't get fired until the end of the season, but it sounds like the further you are from meeting expectations, the bigger your job security will take a hit. So it's implied if you do absolutely atrocious and it gets too low, you'll get on the hot seat. And if it gets too hot, you'll get fired regardless of where the season's at. So straight up, losing to an FCS team is not a good look. This is a huge change from NCAA 14 Dynasty. Instead of it happening over a single week, the coaching carousel will take place over the span of five weeks. One of my earlier points about the hot seat, it looks like all coach contracts and what the school chooses to do with you will be determined on the conference championship week. Once you arrive to bowl season, you'll start being able to manage and view job offers for other coaching positions. Just because you didn't get an offer at first, it takes multiple weeks to get through this experience and bowl season is just the beginning. When schools are looking for a new coach, they consider level, scheme, archetype, pipeline, and coach prestige into play here. So this is a lot different than how the coaching carousel worked in NCAA 14. The attributes I described above form an overall school fit score, and then they give out offers based on the school fit score. Honestly, the five week coaching carousel experience makes it a lot more exciting. Just because a job isn't open today doesn't mean it won't be available next week. So you have to be strategic and maybe you don't pounce on the first offer you get. There are a couple neat screenshots EA provided about the coach carousel and it shows some really interesting factoids like the coach preferences at an open job at Old Miss. They care about archetype, offensive scheme, defensive scheme, and there's also a spot there for alma mater. If a school wants to discriminate or not discriminate based on alma mater, well, hopefully you made that right choice back in coach creation mode. So I guess you'll never catch me filling in for an open KU football job when I'm a K-State alma mater. Unless I'm a bot and couldn't figure out in NCAA 14, I usually let the computer determine when new coordinators come and go. But now as a head coach in college football 25, you'll be able to manage the staff hire and fire coordinators. Woo, we just got through college football 25 coaching one of the three core pillars. And as you can tell, NCAA 14 was pretty bare bones when you're comparing it to the immersion we're gonna get in coach management and everything from abilities, archetype, skills. Recruiting in college football 25 is all about the stages, discovery, pitch, and close. Every interaction will be different for every recruit. Discovery was pretty down pack in NCAA 14. You were able to see who was interested in your school and then start selecting certain prospects to target, to put onto your board, and then uncover their skills, their traits, gem, bust. What really seems different here in College Football 25 is the pitch and close. In NCAA 14, you could see the prospects and their top three motivations and how well your school lines up to that. In College Football 25, as we can tell, it looks like it goes a step further getting deeper into their interests, motivations, and how you can pitch yourself to convince them to come to your school. Final stage is close. It's where you bring in the recruit for an official visit. And if you do well, it seems like you'll be able to secure a verbal commitment following the visit. The whole verbal commit decommit process is brand new to College Football 25 as realistic to real life. And ultimately, you're going to have to wait till National Signing Day to officially put ink and pen to paper. High school grades are based on strengths and weaknesses for your program. It dynamically updates throughout the course of your dynasty, but I'll just come out and say these 14 abilities were exactly what were in NCAA 14. That's not a knack. It's, I mean, honestly, NCAA 14 had it right as well in so many ways in dynasty. So it makes sense to just keep what worked over there. Uh, there's already a lot of depth I'm sure you can take with each of these sections. Now the panels for all 14 school grades are really clean as you can see how you stack up against the rest of the FBS in certain areas like academic prestige. And then each week the game will surface information in the form of a weekly summary to show you the health of your program, how things are progressing and any players at risk of transferring. Authenticity and unrealism in recruits and how all 3,500 random generated prospects are created 
created is insane. To paint the picture, for example, East Texas is known for producing great receivers, but more specifically, known for bringing in the big and physical receivers. And so you'll see bigger and more physical receivers coming out of East Texas, whereas South Florida, you'll see the speedy deep threats. Touched on it earlier, but there are 14 different motivators a recruit can care about. It all maps back to the my school grades, and that was in NCAA 14 with their top three preferences. In NCAA 14, we had pipeline states and bonuses for having a established recruiting presence there. However, in college football 25, there are going to be multiple regions per state. So for example, Florida's got North Florida, Central Florida, and South Florida. Prospects, when they're generated, will start with a list of schools that they're interested in, and they'll narrow it down from 10 to 8 to 5 to 3 throughout the course of a season, and we'll be met with a weekly summary panel that will show us how we're doing in the battles we're pursuing. Big change in this department are the recruiting hours, which is like core currency to spend on actions and scouting each week. It's supposed to model the recruiting resources a program has. So a five-star top tier dynasty will have a thousand recruiting points or hours, I guess you could say, to spend, whereas a one-star dynasty will have 350. Time of year also impacts the recruiting hours, as you've seen in some of the panels in NCAA 14. Once you get to about bowl season, it shuts down for a little bit. Preseason, there's significantly more focus there, so that's also reflected in the new game. Default maximum is 50 hours per recruit. If you have the always be recruiting ability, you'll be able to knock that up to 70 hours. I just wanna take a minute to be in awe of the recruiting boards here. They made these things look clean. I feel like it's pretty easy to navigate. You see the tabs there, recruiting board, prospect list, transfer portal tab, which you'll have to manage, my school, top classes. It just looks and feels really good. We got a little blurb here about busts and gems in the recruiting process. And honestly, this was probably one of the biggest dopamine hits I had while playing NCAA 14 in the recruiting panel, landing a two, three star gem that slipped through the cracks and comes to my school. They don't get a ton in detail, but essentially there's a lot of variance in lower star rated prospects. And there is clearly an opportunity to build your program with high quality players that slip through the cracks of the recruiting rankings. And they even mention my Boise State Broncos, okay, and Oregon State in the early to mid 2000s. They talk about how they excelled finding gems underranked and overlooked. What I'm making out of that paragraph honestly addresses one of my concerns, especially in today's day and age of college football with the transfer portal, is how in the world is a team like Akron ever gonna get themselves out of the rut they're in? and become a competitive force. It seems like you'll have a good chance still to land overlooked, under-recruited players that will actually make a difference in your dynasty. The pitch phase for recruits, you can offer scholarships, search social media, DM the player, contact friends and family, or send the house. This is a neat little feature here where in NCAA 14, you can only offer the scholarship. So there are more ways to allocate your recruiting hours. When a prospect narrows it down to their final five, you have two different options for pitches. Soft sell, it's when you have sort of an idea of what they're interested in, but you want to limit downside risk and you soft sell it. Hard sell is when you know exactly what they want. So you give them the big guns, but if you're wrong, there is a steeper penalty. In addition, they say you can use it if you are desperate and just hoping for the best. So if you feel like you're falling low in a race, might as well just get desperate and send it. Different to the new game, to schedule an official visit, they must be in the top five and you've offered them a scholarship. No recruit wants to visit somewhere they haven't gotten a scholarship from. And man, I can just think back to my dynasties in NCAA 14, how some people just got on the calendar and I wasn't even interested in them. There are game day stakes, which determines the influence bonus that you get when you schedule certain recruits to visit at certain weeks. For example, they show a little tribute here to the UGF Pandas, Brian McCadley, if he visits during that game, a win has a less significant impact than a win against Auburn. However, I must admit it's a little strange at this point because they're saying the Auburn game is higher risk, higher reward than the UGF Pandas. So if they lose to the Pandas, it's only a negative two effect on the recruit. 
but if he loses to Auburn, it's a negative four effect. NCAA 14 had a good foundation for game day objectives, as well as bonus points for tougher opponents, rivalry games, and so forth. I think they did a good job modeling after that, but also adding their own flavor. The transfer portal is way different in this new game compared to the old archaic style of NCAA 14, but that's really because the landscape as a whole has changed. I mean, it's it's completely different than it was back then. Biggest takeaways are player deal breakers, which are like the promises you make to the player. You will also have the opportunity to persuade players that leave to the portal. Higher overalls will be tougher to persuade than lower overalls. But just keep in mind, you have a limited number of these attempts you can use. You can use the gift of a gab ability to increase your number of persuasion attempts. Transfer portal last four weeks and the process is really fast. So quick decisions are essential. Interactions for a transfer will be really similar to that of a high school recruit. So you're going to have to go through the three phases, right? Discovery, pitch, and close to sell a transfer portal player on why they should come to your program. Signing day holds more importance in this edition than NCAA 14. There's early signing day and national signing day. Recruits that are unsigned after signing day will stick around and become walk-ons. And then the days of a player who were actively recruited not committing anywhere they will not just drift off into the either anymore. The team with the highest influence on signing day will get the player as long as they offer them a scholarship. Off season in college football is a pivotal time and in college football 25, it's no different. They have player progression with four different traits, normal, impact, star, elite. Although normal's at the bottom of the four tiers, you can still expect steady growth over their career. Impact development are players that can really change a team. Star development are dudes that could be playing on Sundays. Very few of these guys and they learn quick, which makes this next tier really rare. The best of the best, big statements, potential to be one of the all-time greats. That is a special development tier for the elite. Looking at the player panel for Quinshawn Judkins, you get a good look at how things will look and feel in the game for your players. You get the mentals in the top right, physicals in the bottom right. Remember, there are four tiers to each of the 80 plus abilities out there. And then on the left side, you get a little bit of overview about their bio, their background, ratings. This is what's a bit different. You get to group things rather than focusing on individual attributes. And as you can tell at the last spot, a 10 out of 10 upgrade is capped out for Quinshawn and it varies player by player on how far you can upgrade. There is an ability they mentioned that's called put a ring on it and that'll allow you to potentially remove limit caps after winning championships as mentioned earlier but it's definitely worth mentioning again a big piece of the gameplay to come that was not found in ncaa 14 are physical and mental abilities you can equip up to five physical three mental abilities per player and that's sure going to provide a ton of variance for the game to come again shocker another new feature to college football 25 wear and tear they touched on it in the gameplay deep dive but here in dynasty mode when you're looking at your player cards you also see a tab for health and that is exactly where you see the impact from some of the injuries they've sustained week over week and the associated attribute penalties from those injuries unless you were playing on a modded college football revamped game this will be the first time everyone gets their hands on the 12 team college football playoff which is super exciting because this is going to come before it happens in real life just like the expanded playoffs you'll also be introduced to the latest round of conference realignment that has drastically shook up the landscape. You can reset conferences or just get wild with it and run them however you like with a custom conference. You had some sort of control over this in NCAA 14 where you can narrow it down to four schools per conference or raise it up to 16. In college football 25, you can reduce it to four or grow it to 20 so you get four additional spots. Which makes sense because in real life, some of these power four conferences are getting massive. Just like NCAA 14, you'll have the ability to edit conference rules determining how many conference games they play, rivalry games protected, the name of things, all that fun stuff. And the best part, in my opinion, that was not found in NCAA 14 is the transfer of logos and patches to the field and to uniforms. You'll be able to see the updated graphics in real time, so JMU here, is now in the ACC, which is super cool. Beautiful touch here with scheduling non-conference games. They'll have as many real-world games as were announced 
in the game already, as well as some matchups in 2027, 28, right? Florida State, Georgia, 2029, 2030. Notre Dame, Alabama, or if you're a Boise State fan like myself, next year we should see Boise State taking on Notre Dame in year two of your dynasty. Editing schedules look similar to NCAA 14. You got free reign over the non-conference, but when it comes to in-conference games, there are locks over those games you won't be able to change. In NCAA 14, to redshirt a player, you did it in the preseason panel, and they essentially disappear off your roster, whereas in the new game, it's very realistic to how it works today. You can play up to four games in a season and still hand out the red shirt. Personally, that's great because if I have a roster gap and I want to evaluate one of my new star prospects I brought in, I have up to four games to determine if I need to red shirt him or roll with him for the rest of the year. Well, we made it to the end of the 85 page blog. And let me just say College Football 25, the EA dev team, they cooked on this and I just can't wait to get my hands on the game. I hope this little comparison here going through the deep dive, but also showing what NCAA 14 had to bring in terms of dynasty that you're all familiar with as compared to the new game just shows the levels and the depth of immersion we're about to see and be spoiled in just a couple weeks. If you've been hanging around soaking it up with your boy King Sponge, consider hitting that subscribe button. It all makes a difference. And I'm excited to bring you some fresh, fresh soak it up type content for the new game. So keep it here 